because it opens the pathway towards a quantum gravitational understanding of nature, which the community has been entirely ignoring. Carvel, can you tell us more about the uh, modified theory of gravity? How is it modified and how does it make the theory different from how we've understood it. It was already weird bending space-time. That's already pretty darn weird from, from Einstein. What else do you need to account for dark matter? Well, I, um, the idea of bending space-time is brilliant, mm -hmm. and uh, that formulation is just hypothesis. So it's um, one way to hopefully understand what gravitation is, but it doesn't mean that that theory is correct. There are other ideas what gravitation could be, and that is uh, Verlinde's uh, concept that it's, uh, gravitation is an emergent force because um, the information content in different regions of space is different. Another possibility is that uh, you get gravitation because particles have wave nature, and gravitation just comes about because of um, changes in the ref reflective index, which the particles themselves, because they are oscillating in a vacuum, vac medium, call it ether, uh, and um, that changes the reflective index and that induces uh, gravitational forces. So there are very different in the interpretation of what gravitation could be. We don't know. What so about um, um, gravity waves, which recently yes, have that's been detected? And that is, yeah, well, the gravitational waves um, collapse the possibilities of how we understand gravitation. So if, if any gravitational theory does not accommodate gravitational waves or doesn't accommodate, accommodate them traveling with the speed of light, that theory is ruled out. Yeah? And this, uh, for example, has narrowed the possibilities in Mond. So uh, the original version of a relativistic formulation of Mond had uh, gravitational waves propagating with a different speed, and that has been now, um, um, of course, falsified. Uh, but um, now there are other theories which accommodate that. But that's still interpreting gravitation as a geometrical uh, uh, um, uh, effect, which again itself might not be correct. I'm very pragmatical. What I, uh, rather, rather than spending much of my time thinking about what gravitation could be in terms of its deepest uh, uh, um, um, origin, I want to put into the computer a law of gravitation with which we can study that law of gravitation by looking at what we observe out there. And uh, I know now, um, and that is a, uh, in physics, we call that a five sigma uh, det uh, detection threshold. That's how the Higgs uh, boson was finally accepted to be, uh, to be valid. To be there is by reaching the five sigma detection limit. It's that dark matter doesn't exist. This falsifies the validity of Einsteinian gravitation on the scales of, gra of galaxies and beyond. This means that the whole model of the universe is probably not correct. And that's where we are at this very moment to t investigate which new theories could one develop. Just, just, to, just to try to help explain how it is, is Mond something, the first time I came across the description of it, it was something that seemed to have with have to do with very distant phenomena in the universe, but in fact I've come to understand that Mond is very much closer to home if it's correct. Yeah. Right? So, would you say something about so this? So where does Mond kick in, you would say, right? Yeah. So in the solar system, it's... Sorry uh, to interrupt you, Pavel. Mon, if, can you encapsulate what Mond does? Okay, it's a yeah. kind of, if I understand, yeah. it's kind of gravity varies. Yes, it, okay. So, so tell um, us a little bit about Mond. So, so um, um, as um, Francesca said before, gra uh, Einsteinian gravity has been tested and uh, verified extremely well in the strong field regime, which means around within the solar system and stronger fields around black holes. It seems to be working very well. It's an excellent mathematical description. And that, uh, so any other theory would have to accommodate that. But th that is always one of the working principles. Now, now Mond, originally uh, um, as a description of, um, as an acronym for modified Newtonian dynamics, I prefer to call it Milgromian dynamics in equivalence to Newtonian dynamics. So Milgromian dynamics comes about because Milgram noticed when the measurements of uh, the disk galaxies came in in the early 1980s, when for the first time the velocity um, field in galaxies were mapped out to distances of um, thousands of light years, that um, gravity changes. And how does it change? Well, he, he noticed that there seems to be an acceleration scale, which means that in Einstein's view um, or description, when the, um, when the um, curvature of uh, space becomes very, very, very small. That's the Milgram's constant, which describes this curvature, uh, uh, um, a critical curvature. Beyond that, once we go to nearly flat space-time, the um, accelerations of objects appear to be larger. 
1999, Milgram wrote a very interesting research paper. It was more like a conjecture. We suggested that this change comes about because of the quantum vacuum. The, the way we understand the standard model of particle physics is to today based on quantum field theory. Uh, um, and um, in, in there, the idea, is, the idea is that particles are, as we've heard before, uh, excitations in the fields. And there are many fields which are constantly uh, fluctuating of quantum mechanical um, uh, um, property of the vacuum. And so the vacuum is constantly um, has an energy density which is fluctuating. Now the problem with that is that the uh, what the energy density, what the astronomers need is 120 orders of magnitude below what the quantum field theorists would like. The so if I'm if I'm correct, then even yeah. Empty space is full of energy. Is full of energy, and particles pop out of it. So exactly, and then disappear exactly, very quickly. Yeah. So, so even if you have yeah. perfectly empty space, yeah. it's still got stuff, and this is what's modifying and gravity in, in uh, this. Well, it's exactly. So the idea of Milgram was that when you move through this vacuum, you have a larger pressure because of the bubbling in front of you being ener more energetic because of the blue shift and be rather than behind. And this uh, uh, exerts a force against you, and that's basically why acceleration is not quite as big. This, pro this effect is more pronounced in a gradient, so when the space-time is curved. So you, over here you've got squashed space-time, over the less sp sp squashed space, uh, and then this effect is simply what we describe as Newtonian gravitation. If you are in the regime where you're basically a symmetry, so you have the particle which is accelerating, and the vacuum here is as unsquashed as over there, uh, then um, you effectively have a large acceleration because the effect largely disappears. Yeah, that's a quant And so this paper is a very remarkable um, uh, research paper because it opens the pathway towards a quantum gravitational understanding of nature, which the community has been entirely ignoring because everybody knows there is dark matter for a fact, essentially. The colleagues are completely convinced while well, believing in dark matter and uh, uh, and uh, they, they ignore the falsifications of dark matter entirely because it's become a, a question of belief in the scientific system. So we've got two theories now which will account for the same observations. One postulates stuff we can't see, and the other one postulates a shift in the way we understand gravity that goes back to Einstein and says that gravity will change in different parts of space. So what do you th how do you think you could distinguish between these two well, theories? Well, it's completely simple. Uh, it's, okay. uh, you have to be pragmatic. You have to okay. do your job as a scientist properly. Falsification is the key word. You test the one theory. Dark matter exists. Test it. It's falsified with more than five sigma. It doesn't exist. You drop it. You don't even touch it anymore ever. In our research group, group we do not touch dark matter anymore. The, and then you look at the other hypothesis. It has to be then a modification of gravity or not a modification. It's just a different form of gravity. I do not like the term modification because nature does not modify, right? It's just a different law. And then we work with that law and we try to falsify that equally. So far, every single prediction made in 1983, you look at the three research papers which Milgram has published, he put down a number of predictions what galaxies should behave like if that formulation of gravitation is true. Every one of them has been verified to an incredible uh, amount, even galaxies which were not known to exist at that time. Yeah. Jessica I think will I should disagree, I think. Come so. in and try to explain why we haven't all stopped working on dark matter. <sighs> so the the main kind of disagreement with the, the dark matter model that Pavel's describing is that there are galaxies that are are moving faster than we think that they should be. When you have two galaxies that merge in particular, if they're all full of dark matter, the kind of gravity of this dark matter should slow them down. And we see galaxies moving faster than some of our modeling suggests that they should be. Now, within the dark matter model, and indeed also within modified gravity, I would say we don't actually have a uh, a theory that predicts exactly how fast all these galaxies should be moving. There's a lot of inputs into that. So one of them is indeed slowing down through dark matter. But you would also need to really know the, the cosmological history of all of these galaxies, the effects of all of the very complicated physics of the stars and um, other kind of regular matter within these galaxies should come into play. So I think within the dark matter model, the reason we haven't just all said, well, okay, this is just inconsistent, we're gonna stop working on it, 
is that it's really quite a complicated question how fast galaxies should be moving. And the dark matter model has been so successful at explaining other observations that I really think we should just be working on both. But I might I might interject here okay. um, because I hear the statement many times that uh, the dark matter models, of course, the cosmological dark matter models have been successful in, in accounting for a, a, a large variety of observations. It is wrong. I don't know any single observation which has actually been successfully reproduced by, by the dark matter models. One case. If you look, if you count the number of galaxies within our uh, surroundings, you go out to hundreds of uh, millions of light years. You can count the number of galaxies per unit space you have, right? And uh, we see that the density of matter increases out to um, about um, 1,500 million light years. So it's, that's already a large distance. Um, and um, which means we live in a gigantic under density. This is called the KBC void, which was, was discovered by Keenan, Barg, and Coey in 2012, and it's been verified by subsequent studies, also looking at the number of galaxy clusters. We live in a region of cosmological space, which has a lower mass density, a smaller number of galaxy clusters, smaller number of galaxies, than further out. Now, that huge void is completely inconsistent with the lambda CDM model. Mm -hmm. That lambda CDM model, by the assumption of uh, how does that much mean the dark matter model? The dark the matter, dark yeah, matter the dark matter model. model. So uh, I don't think that's synonymous. Okay. I think it's oh, worse. So, so, so the uh, because it is, assumes homogeneity and isotropy, which okay. is reasonable, but it cannot allow such large dis, uh, discrepancies in. Okay, so yeah. Pavel, you're saying that the current data is inconsistent with dark matter. I, I thought that mond and dark matter were kind of equivalent in that they're arguing for the same, no, no. And but you're saying no, the data out there is currently inconsistent with with the, uh, dark matter and is consistent with MOND. Absolutely, because, okay. um, well, the, the remarkable thing about this is you can you can test whether this under density can account uh, occur in this dark matter model. It cannot. Bjorn, Bjorn can In we... MOND, it can. Okay, Bjorn, <laughs> can you uh, enlighten us when we've got two uh, uh, conflicting accounts of whether dark matter is I mean, still a viable theory or not? It's a note in the context here about whether a theory is successful or not, or whether there's evidence of it. Um, cosmology uh, is in a very unique uh, position as a science. It's also developed its own criterion for evidence. So the goalpost for what counts as scientific evidence has also shifted okay. in the 20th century. At the same time, there are arguments, of course, that if you are looking at very large scales, or so in micro, like in physics, at the you know theoretical physics, you do, do need sort of other criteria to access things. But this is a very this is a very questionable thing. I mean, uh, lambda CDM model or the standard model is sometimes called the concordance model because this is the principle that was invented. It's something called concordance. It's considered evidence in cosmology. No other sciences has this. Uh, and so, what it means to for something to be proven in cosmology is that if you can infer consistent patterns across multiple data sets that is inferred as evidence that the theory you use to create it is correct. Okay. And that means you can, you can claim uh, that you have really solid evidence for dark matter, but yet you have no observational evidence for any okay. single parameter. So, Francesca, have you been shifting the goalposts? I think what Bjorn's saying is basically correct in terms of what is considered evidence within cosmology is to do with often consistency within the current model. But there's a very good reason for this, which is that in cosmology, our, the thing we're studying is the whole universe. So all we can do is look at the sky with telescopes. We cannot do experiments because we only have one universe and we didn't get to choose the starting conditions. If I'm doing an experiment in biology, I can you know, try design the exact setup that I want in a laboratory. Cosmology and astrophysics are more like archaeology. All we can do is look at what's happened. So in that way, we have had to develop different ways of doing things. Now, I would say that there have been, you know, some things that are predictions in the more normal sense. Um, so, for example, if dark matter exists and Einstein's theory of general relativity is, broadly speaking, correct, um, even at large scales, then we would expect to observe um, 
the bending of light around dark matter. This is called gravitational lensing. And then, you know, indeed, we have observed that. So there are some things where you can kind of make predictions and see them. But with a lot of science these days, in particular, a lot of fundamental physics, there's so much input that needs to go into every calculation. You have to make so many assumptions and everyone has to do that. We have to do it. You have to do it if you're calculating in modified gravity. You have to do that to calculate anything, that it can be quite hard to disentangle exactly what's the prediction and what's just consistency within the theory. I think there's no clear-cut line between those two. Well, in fact, that leads us... Neatly. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.